righty. Let's see if anybody else is coming in. Okay. All right, so we're going to get started, everybody. Um, thanks, everyone, for coming and hanging out with us for a little bit tonight. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about our new friend on the island, the Queensland Longhorn Beetle. Um, and I see a lot of folks are from the east side. Uh, we've got some visitors from off island, kind of nice little smattering in the chat. So, um, yeah, thank everybody for coming and, and being willing to kind of listen and learn together as we try to make this a little bit more um, of an issue of awareness between local farmers so that we can get on top of prevention and treatment and, you know, save as much of our food crops as we can amidst all the other fun pests that we have here. Um, so I'm just going to do a quick round of introductions. Um, we've got myself on the call. Uh, my name is Kyle Jackson. I'm the farmer member coordinator for the Ulu Cooperative. And um, I've been lucky enough to get a couple of our farmers, um, Anthony Oleon, who's got a farm in Keao, and uh, Debbie Ward, who's got a, a farm up in Curtistown. And also joining us is Roxana Myers from the USDA PBARC. And she does a lot of really awesome work um, with nematodes and trying to help farmers, you know, improve everything from soil conditions to fight different diseases, um, you know, using our biological controls instead of, um, you know, chemical means or other treatments. So we're really excited to have her on the call and sharing, um, you know, kind of the most recent updates that we have with this and also some experiences from our farmers who have been affected um, by this pest. And so for now, I'm gonna pass it off to our first farmer, Anthony, and he'll do a little introduction and kind of tell you guys a bit about his experience um, with the beetle on his property. All right, hello. Can you guys see my screen? Hi, right, right, my name is Anthony Olayon. I'm out in Keao Puna, the Kohaku side of Orchid Land. And we've been here on my family's land for about 40 plus years. Um, so I guess we first started noti noticing the QRB around plus or minus a couple of years in 2015. And they were first spotted or noticed, I guess, from our kukui. So we had kukui that were probably 20 something years old and they just started dropping branches. And then we started noticing the the south the sawdust coming out of the, the bark and the textbook exit wounds from the QLB. Um, shortly after that, I think the next tree that it attacked was a Buddha's hand, a citrus. And we lost that tree. Um, and then around 2020, we reported on the USDA website for, um, I guess they were trying to gather all the sightings throughout the island. And we had a technician come out and they came out and confirmed that we did indeed have a pretty big infestation. Um, let's see if I got more. So fast forward to early 2022. These are kind of newer photos, but these are the Ulu trees that were at first damaged by pigs. So they came in, hopped over our wired rings and debarked the ulu. Some of them, they debarked the entire circumference of the, the trunks. Um, and then that's when we noticed the QOB like really targeting the ulu. So you can see some of the exit wounds here. Um, I think you can kind of see a little bit of sawdust here. Um, and then uh, some of the branches, this is like, a month or two ago on a tree that I pruned um, after we had that big rain, some of the branches just started breaking and um, started looking into those. And these are some of the critters that I found. Um, I think this is an ambrosia beetle. So we've been finding those a lot. And then of course the grub and then one of the, I guess, uh, Pupa, right? Pupa ready to uh, emerge from the, the trunk of the tree. Um, let's see, what else do I have here? 
Yeah, so we lost about three ulu trees in total. We had to cut one down because it just wasn't going to um, come back. But luckily, the roots were still intact. So this is one photo. We cut that one down in about, about a year ago. And this is a year's worth of growth. So at least it's still growing. Um, so this is another tree. Uh, this is like a before and after pruning. So I pruned this tree and I noticed all of the lateral branches here after I did the pruning were getting heavily targeted by the QLB. And that's that photo I showed before where the branches were just kind of breaking off. So I'm kind of debating if I have to get rid of this tree eventually just because the infestation is so high. Um, other than that, I think that's all I have to share. It's been a challenge. Awesome. Thanks, Anthony. Um, and we'll probably come back and, and have some questions for you guys on the back end. Um, Debbie, if you want to unmute yourself and grab the screen share, we'll pass it off to you. And if you could just introduce uh, your farm and kind of how long you've been there and then go into the uh, QLB stuff, that would be great. Oh, we need you to unmute yourself as well, if you can. There we go. Aloha, my name is Debbie Ward. Um, I'm part of a farm called Laiku up in Curtistown off of North Ala Road. Have um, maybe 10 producing ulu trees and lots more in the ground. And um, probably met this critter um, on the door of my house uh, back in 2016. Had no idea what it did or why, but it was uh, pretty awesome because you can see the size of the quarter and the size of the uh, of the bug. And I had no idea that it was going to be doing any damage. But um, the next thing that I saw was um, dead trees, including my two favorite citrus trees outside my back door, and um, cut them down and discovered these channels uh, made by the larva that and these larvae emerged from those holes as we were cutting down the tree um, and took it into the department of ag talked to Sandy chen and he um, he explained what it was and said they had only seen a little bit of damage heard about it in 2009 but didn't really know what else what the hosts were or, or where we were gonna you know what we were gonna see um <clears throat> And then I started seeing my kukui trees die one after another. Um, this one is looks relatively healthy, um, but um, it started getting broken branches. And you can see that was with the entry hole. So what we would do is we would cut them and then uh, take in the affected branches to uh, USDA and eventually to Stacy as well. And both of them were working on insectaries. Um, USDA put out trap cro uh, traps for about a year, and we monitored the monitored the traps every other day, um, and turned over the beetles that we found in the traps. We didn't think the traps were particularly successful, but we did probably find ten beetles during that time. Um, and my son would go out at night. And he would climb up into the trees and he would find them. He would, they would scream. They actually make a loud noise um, that's a little like a shriek and they bite. So he would actually use gloves to catch them. And we turned a lot of um, the ones that he caught in. So apparently they are easy to find at night. I've never seen one on a tree, but he's good at it. Um, and then we started seeing more damage on our citrus, particularly the tangerines and the tangelos seem to be the most affected. So you can see here, there's frass coming out. Uh, a lot of frass can be found on the ground as well. You can see a lot of, um, of older damage here. This was probably a year old already, but there is still you know, in new intrusions of, of larvae coming out. And, um, Sometimes you don't see this action because it's covered with moss. I don't know about everybody else, but my my trees are mossing up far differently than they used to. And um, so I kind of, when I rub the moss off, I usually find um, some damage. So this is what the early damage looks like. This is when I think when the larvae is just eating the bark itself. Um, and 
if you're lucky enough to get Rex Sand or Bisque or um, some nematodes at this point, you'll probably be able to stop it. <laughs> Um, but this is what it looks like after it's quite a lot of damage. The tree's trying to recover by producing more callus tissue and closing up the hole, but it's probably been invaded already. So this is what my poor tangerine, uh, tangelo tree looks like. You can see um, a lot of damage down in here, and this tree will probably not recover, although it still produces a lot of fruit. Um, I don't think it's going to live in the long term. Um, because all of the damage is down here. If one of the branches is affected, I just cut the branch off, take it into SDA, and the tree seems to do fine. But if it's down here in the trunk, I don't have a lot of hope for it. Um, so this is uh, this is what it looks like close up with the exit holes and the callus tissue. But you can see it it has a lot of extensive damage. Um, so then I discovered it on elderberry. And um, elderberry is, is an amazing host for them. Every single branch that you cut from an elder, elderberry tree will have, have uh, larvae in it. And so it comes out at the axles, it comes out all over the place and you see a lot of, um, of goo, um, of whatever it is, exudate. Um, and you see that in the cuckoos as well. The cuckoos will just drip with goo all over the place when they are affected. Um, so this larva just came out yesterday from the uh, elderberry tree that I was cutting down. Um, but then we um, heard about um, USDA's new project with Roxanne. And so this tree had quite a lot of frass coming out, a lot of ooze. Can't see it all here, but, um, but it was definitely damaged. And you can see it was probably tusked by a pig. And uh, I think that's true, what Anthony said about uh, the pig's um, probably creating an entry point. But then Roxanne came and sprayed the tree and um, sprayed the, put injected nematodes into the visible holes. And, um, oh, that's a different, this is this, so this is Kukui tree one. This is another one where I didn't take a picture when the tree was almost completely gone, but the, the entry hole was right in this area. And there was, I didn't think the tree had any hope whatsoever. It was completely damaged all the way. And there were, you know, big wide wound openings and so forth. But she sprayed it and, um, whoa, that was a big earthquake. <laughs> okay. And that's what the tree looks like now. All those new branches have come out since the uh, initial treatment. And the tree appears to be you know, recovering. I wouldn't say that that's a healthy tree because probably in the next windstorm, the branches will break, up, break off. But you can see the kind of recovery that the tree made um, in spite of the um, fairly serious damage. So my, my, my lesson to you, if you're listening and you haven't, uh, you haven't been aware of the um, nematode treatment, which I found extremely helpful and, and hopeful um, is don't let your trees, don't th let this happen to your trees. Um, <laughs> if you can, if you can uh, attack them early with the nematode treatment, I think that you will find that you'll have better success and you won't lose a tree like this as I have. So best, best luck to everyone. Thank you. Stop share. That was great. Those pictures were awesome. I mean, not awesome. They were terrible, but great. Terrifying, yeah. <laughs> great and helpful. Um, really, really good to, you know, kind of go through that with you and then see the effects of the treatment that Roxana did. That's really cool. All right. I'm going to pass it off one more time to Roxana, and she can kind of introduce herself and what she does with USDA before going into her presentation. Thank you, Kyle, and thanks um, for the invitation to come here and speak um, with you today about my research. And thanks so much to Tony and Debbie for sharing their experiences. And it's a great introduction um, for this short presentation I'm going to give to you. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, OK, can you guys see that? Yes. Great. OK, thanks, Debbie. Um, OK, my name is Roxana Myers, and <clears throat> I'm a research nematologist at USDA 
um, Daniel K. Anoy Pacific Basin Agriculture Research Center. And this is a picture of our facility in Hilo. And our mission at PBARC is to help growers mitigate uh, pests and diseases, as well as um, post-harvest treatments, uh, anything that can improve the profitability of uh, the growers in our state. Um, I actually, I work mostly with plant parasitic nematodes, um, which are very damaging uh, nematodes that affect the plant roots and prevent um, the plant from uptaking uh, nutrients and water. Uh, however, um, I got on this side project uh, here and um, we're using uh, entomopathogenic nematodes, also known as insect parasitic nematodes. And so these would be the good guys. Uh, so I'm happy to share my project today about how we're using these to try to mitigate some of the damage that the Queensland longhorn beetle is causing. And my team members are Kathy Mello and Kirsten Snook. My screen's not moving. Sorry. Let me stop share and try that again. Sorry about that. Okay. All right, is that on full screen? <clears throat> It's yeah. not, but if um, full screen isn't working after another try, maybe we could just scroll through it. Yeah, that works for everybody. But I think you can see those slides pretty well, and um, we do have the ability to zoom in slightly, at least on my on my computer. Man, my practice went so well. <laughs> I know. We went over all the technical things before everybody, I promise. Yes. A couple times. <laughs> Roxana, if you go to the slide and you don't um, go to present view, but just like that, um, we can see really well if you want to just scroll from one slide to the next in that view. Okay. <clears throat> Sorry, I can make this a little better. Mm, that's terrible. Okay. How's that? Back in business. Okay. Sorry. No. <laughs> oh, all right. Might so, as well. Uh, excuse me. Okay. <laughs> On with the show then. <laughs> um, so today I'm going to be talking about insect parasitic nematodes. Um, they're microscopic, non-segmented roundworms that attack insect pests. Uh, they have a broad host range, um, they're very easy to apply, and they're safe for humans, animals, and plants. Um, the good thing is they're not um, regulated by uh, the federal, um, by the FDA, um, so they don't require any re-entry period after application. So this is a picture of my nematodes in culture, and this is them emerging uh, from an insect cadaver um, and in one of our insect rearing colonies. So how do these nematodes control insect pests? Well, the infective juveniles enter into an insect host and they have a symbiotic bacteria which is released uh, into the insect. And that's actually what does, it kills the nematode um, through sepsis. And once the insect dies, the nematodes begin to feed off of the cadaver, they begin development, and then they reproduce within the host. Uh, after um, they're done reproducing, um, the infective juveniles emerge, and then they search out for a new host, and then the cycle continues. 
So um, insect parasitic nematodes are commonly used as a biological control agent and increasingly used um, even more nowadays um, on the mainland. There's many commercial products available. However, um, we're not permitted to be introducing these products into the state of Hawaii. So this brought us to um, <clears throat> go out and do a survey to see uh, if these nematodes existed already um, here in the islands. And we had an um, easy start because uh, Dr. Arno Hara had did a survey previously um, 30 years ago where he was successful um, in finding the species Heteroreptitis indica. So we followed his footsteps about 14 years ago, went back to all the same places, and sure enough, we were able to recover these uh, nematodes. This is a picture um, of Kathy Mello and her husband who did most of the surveys. And fortunately for them, they got to visit all of the different beaches in the state because that's where this nematode is found, um, right near the first uh, vegetation line uh, in sandy soils. So this is just a collection of all the different soils and sands that we collected and found these nematodes in across the state. So we've tested these um, nematodes against approximately 40 different insect pests. Um, most of the most successful ones are when the insect has a stage uh, that's inside of the soil because these nematodes are from the soil. Uh, that's where they wanna be and they do the best there. However, we had really good success um, using them against the sweet potato weevil. And we found out they would actually go inside of the tuber um, even if they weren't completely submerged in the soil. And they would hunt down the sweet potato weevil larvae um, inside these tuberous roots. So in a, we just did a simulated field study and found that they reduced the population by 77%. So now we've moved on and we're doing some field trials <clears throat> to see um, if this can be an effective use of these nematodes for growers. So uh, thinking about this um, made us realize maybe these nematodes can go inside cryptic habitats where they're protected um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be uh, within a soil environment. So along come the Queensland longhorn beetle. And if these nematodes could chase down sweet potato weevil larvae, um, why not chase down this, um, the longhorn beetle larvae inside of the trunk and branches of these trees? So I don't wanna go into much introduction. The uh, growers did an excellent um, presentation on that. I just wanna say that what's interesting is that this beetle um, back in its homeland of Australia is not known to infest uh, agricultural crops at all. Um, so since it's not a problem over there, there's very little known about this insect pest, about its biology and its habits. Um, and also no control measures have been documented. So we were hoping that the nematodes would have this uh, potential to hunt these larvae um, in, in this inside of the tree. So this is some of the damage that we're seeing uh, to different orchard crops. Um, there's the citrus, kukui, and cacao. And what happens is the larvae goes into the tree, um, creates these galleries uh, as it feeds and tunnels, and it girdles the bark of the branches and the trunks. So soon you get um, a disruption of the uptake of water and nutrients, and it also loses its structural integrity. So branches start falling off, and eventually um, you can see death of the tree itself. So we did a lot of experiments in the lab and we found out, yes, it is a host. Um, the, the beetle is a host for the nematodes and that was great. So we started doing some greenhouse trials and this is uh, one of the trials that we did. I'll just share with you now. Um, we wanted to test uh, Bavaria bassiana uh, as well as the nematode Heteroreptitis indica. And then we did a combination of the two, hoping that the nematodes would transport the Bavaria spores inside of the galleries themselves. So this picture of the darkened larvae, that's an infected larvae with the nematodes inside and it fluoresces because of the bacteria, the symbiotic bacteria. So it's very easy to tell um, if you open up the trunk um, and split these logs, you know, if we had success or not. So we just looked at it for 12 days. Um, our first trial, we saw um, mortality of 45% uh, of the larvae um, with the nematodes and around 25% uh, with Bavaria. So 
we thought, well, this could be a little bit better. So we went back out um, down, down to Bayfront um, and we wanted to collect another isolate of these nematodes thinking that the nematodes from the wild are gonna be more fit and much more um, vigorous than um, maybe the ones that I've been rearing in the lab for the last 10 years. So we um, went there and yes, it did improve our success rate. Um, we had mortality rates up to 58% with the nematodes. And um, unfortunately, the Bavaria didn't um, produce, uh, didn't have a very success um, rate in this trial. Uh, and com combining the two um, didn't seem to make any difference um, as just the nematodes alone. So we know that it, PLB is a good host um, for this nematode. Uh, these nematodes are hunters. So they do hunt the larvae in the galleries and cause mortality. It can affect larvae, pupae, and adults. Um, and we feel that it was more effective than the Bavaria treatment alone. So then <clears throat> we wanted to go out and try this in the field. Um, and it was so nice of Debbie to invite us to come out and give this a try. Uh, we went out, um, we just applied to her heavily infested trees. Uh, this was maybe around last December. And then with the holidays and things got busy, we never got a chance to go back out there until four months later. And we were very surprised and happy to see that it did look like um, we had some, we might have, <clears throat> you know, had some effect uh, with the nematode treatment. So as you can see in the photos, at first when we treated, there was a lot of frass. Um, there was a lot of sap coming out of the, the trunk. Um, when we went back, the tree was no longer producing this defensive sap. Um, we didn't see any new frass or new shavings uh, where the larvae had kicked it out. And we even saw some new growth. So we felt very encouraged and that got us very inspired to keep um, working in the field and um, you know, seeing if we could have a continued success with this. So we wondered though, why did we get a better result? It seemed like than we did in the greenhouse. Well, the greenhouse trial was only 12 days. This was four months later before we even went back and look at the results. So when we actually take a QLB larvae and put it on a white trap um, and get the nematodes out and then count them, <clears throat> one larvae can produce over 200,000 nematodes. Even the pre-pupa was over 400,000 nematodes. So when you have um, one infestation from your initial inoculation, uh, it's going to keep producing subsequent generations of nematodes uh, tenfold. So um, these nematodes are going to be hungry and they're going to you know, wake up, hunt, go down the galleries and find any remaining larvae or um, new larvae that have just hatched and infect those nematodes. So I think this is the result of accumulation over time um, of multiple nematode generations um, existing within the tree and branches. And so this is what it looks like when the nematodes are just packed uh, inside of these larvae and then they're starting you know, to come out. So uh, I'm gonna tell you um, quickly uh, how you can go about applying these nematodes yourself. I wish we could go out to every farm um, and treat for everyone. Um, but as you'll see from this presentation, this is a very tedious task and it takes a very long time. So hopefully um, I can train you guys to do your own and we can get you some nematodes and then you can go out to your farm um, and apply these. And the best thing, like Debbie said, try to hit it early at the beginning before your infestation becomes too heavy. Uh, so the step, first step, step one would be scout your orchard uh, for QLB damage. So what we look for is that sawdust like frass, um, oozing sap from the tree, girdling of the trunk and lifting of the bark and also adult emergence holes. So this is a video um, <clears throat> that we took uh, this is Kathy showing all the different symptoms and signs that there's QLB inside of this tree. Uh, so that's the first thing you got to get down there. Even if it's on your hands and knees, you got to get under the canopy and you got to really visually inspect each tree, each branch, each limb, or you're going to just miss it. When you're looking at your orchard as a whole, it looks great, but when you got to really look up close. So our suggestion is to go out and just Multiple people just hit every tree and every time you find a sign of damage, just tag it. Um, so you have everything tagged before you get your nematodes so you don't waste time um, trying to look for which trees need to be treated once you have your nematodes in hand. So this is um, the very uh, 
<clears throat> easy to spot symptoms um, along the branch um, of the frass. And then here she's she's pressing the, the branch itself and see that sponginess, see how it's bouncing back. Um, that sponginess indicates that there's hollowness within the branch. Um, the larvae has been feeding in there. And so it's, it's really soft to the touch. So go and tag that. Okay, now this is the most important uh, step of all. Um, this is the actual nematode application, and you have to follow this very carefully. If you miss one of these steps, your treatment is not going to be as effective as it could be. Um, so it's, it's very important to remember um, all of these um, key processes. Um, the first is when you get your nematodes, store them in a dark pool location until you apply. And I'm going to say use it uh, ASAP, but that's not necessarily true. I think you have to count on the weather first. So it's okay to hold them for a week if you wanna wait for the perfect conditions to apply your nematodes, it's gonna be much more effective. And remember, do not refrigerate these nematodes. They're tropical creatures and they like it warm. Um, so just don't you know, bake them in the sun, but you don't need to keep them you know, in the refrigerator. So it's very important to apply the nematodes very early in the morning at dusk, or I think this is the key is on rainy days. So we've been doing a cacao treatment. I've treated for three times and I have not had the success um, that I had at Debbie's Field. And we have seen some results on some trees, but not all. And I know that we've had these really hot days. And even though we try to go out there in the morning, the humidity is still much lower. Um, and I think that has been detrimental to us. So I remember when we went out to Debbie's place, it was pouring rain. We were soaked to the bones. And that's what the nematodes like, though. They want that high humidity. They want it nice and cool. They like the moisture. Um, it was raining so hard. I couldn't even write on paper. I had to put everything in the phone. But you know what? That is the key. So this last time we treated at the nematode field, I waited for this cone low. And I said, we're going out there to get soaked again. Because if you get soaked, your nematodes are going to be so happy and your treatment is going to be way more effective. So that's my main recommendation right there. Don't forget that. <laughs> um, and OK, almost as importantly is you must agitate your nematode solution before transferring it or um, drawing it up uh, with your syringe. The nematodes will settle to the bottom very, very quickly. So if you want to have a uniform inoculum every single time you go to move them or um, you know, dispense of the, the nematodes, you need to um, stir it or shake it and make sure they're all up so you have a uniform solution. We've been using um, a disposable plastic syringe, uh, thanks to Kathy who came up with this wonderful methodology. Um, you can get these syringes and needles at any feed supply store. So we're using a 16 gauge, one and a half inch needle um, on the syringe. And that's how we actually inject the nematodes into the tree itself. Um, and don't forget to stir the solution uh, before drawing it up. So you wanna apply the nematodes directly into the trees. You inject them into the feeding galleries through holes um, where you see the um, sawdust like frass, the oozing sap, or under the lifting bark. So what we'll do is we'll just press, you just press with the needle and, until you find a place where it just sinks right in. Then you know you've hit the spot, you're inside the gallery and you slowly dispense the solution and you need to watch the underside of the branch if the, if the nematode solution is coming out because it's gonna follow that gallery wherever it is and it's gonna start you know, spilling out somewhere. Once it starts going out, you stop, you go poke around, you find another one, you go up and down the tree, you hit every single spot you can because you wanna give your nematodes the best chance possible at finding these larvae. So you don't wanna just put it all into one place. You wanna try to put as high as you can, definitely, um, and as many spots as you can. Because you can only really put a little bit in, in one gallery at a time. So you want to try to find multiple uh, locations to insert your nematodes. So here's Kathy injecting it um, into uh, one of these uh, galleries. And then you can see how the needle just sunk right down in there. Um, see, once it gets in there, you know you've hit the sweet spot. But when you start seeing it coming back out, the liquid, it's time to stop because you're just going to waste um, your inoculum. 
Uh, so she'll be down on her hands and knees to get to the bottom of these trunks and whatever it takes to do it. So you have to be dedicated to really take the time and energy um, to make this work successfully. Uh, it is um, a tedious process, but it's getting the nematodes in there where you need to get them. Um, you have to, there's just, you know, uh, it's a biological agent. You have to give them every chance possible. Um, so, you know, you have to just... Uh, <clears throat> try to get them uniformly throughout. Um, one thing that she observed the last time we were out there was even if you don't see these uh, signs of the infestation, but you see um, black lesions on the, on the trunk or the branches itself, those black lesions are caused from the larvae feeding underneath of the bark. So you can actually stick that needle right into those black lesions and it'll go right through. And you know, cause you can't get it into the bark, but once you hit that black spot, as another place you can insert the nematodes. So we're um, trying to raise as many nematodes as we can. Uh, we just went into an agreement with um, the Big Island Invasive Species Council, and they're kind enough to raise the nematodes also for the farmers in our community. And you can reach out to them um, by contacting Jade Mia Shiro uh, by email at jade. Uh, Mia at hawaii.edu. And these nematodes are going to be provided at no charge to the community, um, thanks to BISC. And we just ask that you request um, that you make observations. And if you could just please report back to us where your location is, what crops that you're putting it on, and what kind of results that you saw. Um, and just keep in mind, uh, go back and look at those uh, one, two, threes on how to do it to make sure uh, you do it properly. But please uh, feel free to reach out to me as well. Um, at any time and we can help get you some of these nematodes and you can treat, but the earlier, the better um, for sure. So I'd like to thank Tracy Matsumoto and her family um, for helping me to do some of the filming. Uh, Charmaine Silva is always helping us out in the field. And especially I'd like to thank Stacey Chun uh, who works for the Hawaii Department of Agriculture who has been a great cooperator for us um, in this project. So if you have any questions, uh, there's my email. Uh, please feel free to reach out to me um, anytime. And so this photo here is just um, the nematodes emerging uh, from the insect cadaver. And you can see they're just very active and hungry and uh, ready to go out and search for your QLB larvae. Awesome. Thank you so much, Roxana. That was amazing. And I actually didn't know that they were or maybe you mentioned it, but I, I forgot that they were being provided free of charge. So that's super, super cool of you guys and this. Um, I saw that we had Jade in there. Jade, feel free to drop a comment if you have anything to let farmers know um, to keep heads up for contacting you guys in the chat. Um, and I think that, you know, that kind of takes us probably right to the Q&A portion because it sounds like you kind of wrapped up the, you know, preventing and what to expect. Um, so it sounds like noticing it as soon as possible if you're in a potential affected area, which sounds like is Lower Puna all the way through Pana Eva. And we've heard folks um, say recently that they found them as far as Wainaku and Keokaha. So, you know, if you, have, if you guys are in that area, if you've got friends in that area, it sounds like checking your portraits is a first step, is a great way to go. And then if you catch anything, then getting in contact with these guys to get treatment going is probably the best, the best steps to go about it. Um, so we will go ahead and open it up. We've got some questions coming in the chat and I will put them up for either the farmers or uh, Roxana, depending on who they are. And if you guys want to ask one in person, just use the emoticon thing on the bottom right hand um, to raise your hand and we'll pick on you. You can ask a verbal question, uh, but you guys can just start dropping them in the chat if you're curious or if you just wanna let us know if you found QLB on your property, um, maybe out of the areas that we mentioned. Um, so the first question I think for Roxana is gonna be, what stage, uh, this is from Debbie, what stage is eating the bark at the early stage? Debbie, maybe you can clarify that unless you know what she means by that. Yeah, I know what she means. So the ones that are underneath, when you see it right under the bark and like lifting the bark, that's the very early stages. So you can actually peel back and you'll see like really small, the larvae is 
quite small and tiny at that point. But once they start getting bigger, you know, they want more food to eat. So that's when they start digging that gallery straight to the middle and, and making those big, long galleries. Awesome. And then we've got a follow up from Debbie that says, please say, um, oops, I don't know what just happened. I just hit that question for myself. Okay. Oh, Please. no, I see it. Yeah, okay. There you go. Yeah, uh, Debbie wanted to know again how what causes the larvae to die. Um, and what happens is there's an intimate relationship between this bacteria and the nematode. And the nematode needs the bacteria, and the bacteria needs the nematode to do this job. So they, they have to have each other. But um, before the nematode will leave the insect cadaver, it will feed on um, some of that bacteria and take it up. So when it goes to infect the next larvae, it will you know, regurgitate that, that bacteria, and then that's what kills the larvae itself. It's a sepsis caused from bacteria, and that kills the um, insect larvae. And then the nematode will feed a, on the a cadaver and then also on the bacteria again, and then that's how the cycle. So the nematode doesn't actually um, kill the larvae, but it does you know, provide the bacteria with a way to get inside of the insect. It's like its carrier. Awesome. And then we'll go to- What's Keith. the name of the bacteria? Uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. Debbie. Uh, Photoraptus. Photoraptus, thank you. And then Keith asks, can the nematodes survive in soil and how long do they remain alive? Yeah, so the nematodes are from the soil originally. They're soil inhabiting organisms. So um, yes, you know, they can survive uh, in soil and they can survive as long as they can find a host. Um, as far as the nematodes remaining alive, like in general, if you don't have them with the host and you're just like holding them in your container, um, they can survive decently um, for a month. Um, you know, we've had some cultures that survive up to three months, but you get more and more mortality, you know, every day. And then they're not going to be as fit. So that's why I'm saying when I first get them off of those insect cadavers, they're very active. They're very fit. Um, that's when, you know, they have a lot of energy reserves in them. And then they'll have lots of energy to go hunt down these larvae. So that's why I recommend trying to use them as soon as possible, weather permitting. Um, because so they can stick around and go into like a quiescent state and, and wait for a food source. Uh, it's just if, if you're holding on to them, you prefer not to let it get to that. Awesome. Super cool. Um, I think we'll switch. We'll do um, we'll jump to one more. And then there's a bunch of questions about like what do they eat and other things that they harm. But let's ask um, if they attack Chinese rose or sorry if they are on other islands as of now, or just our island? Not that I know of. Okay, yeah, okay, to good. reiterate that, um, it's not known to occur on any other island. This is Stacy from the Department of Agriculture. Thanks, Stacy. Thank you. And then we've got a couple of combination questions, which we can probably roll into one. Um, Keith wants to know if they attack Chinese rose beetles. Uh, Katie wants to know if they eat mealybugs. And Chris wants to know if they eat earthworms. Or will they harm earthworms? Um, OK. Wow. <laughs> All right, um, let me see. OK, first, Chinese so, rose beetle, I'm very interested in um, doing that. We, we've tried to do some studies. Um, they will attack. Chinese rose beetle, we haven't been able to really do any proper studies because we haven't been able to have an insect, um, we haven't been able to rear them in the lab. What's been great about working at PBARC is we have a lot of entomologists and we have a rearing facility. So usually I have access to lots of insects, but it's hard to just go out and like dig insects from the wild and try to get enough to you know really do a proper study. So that's something I'm really interested in doing is, um, is doing more research with the Chinese rose beetle because it makes sense to me because there's, you know, the adults go to the ground, the larvae's in the ground, the nematodes like in the ground. So it would seem like that would be would be effective. Um, mealybugs, um, I haven't, um, I don't know offhand if anyone's I'm sure they've tried. I haven't tried. Um, the problem is uh, if it's like a root mealybug, I think you're going to have um, success probably with that. These are very um, 
They have a broad host range. They've pretty much gone on everything I've tried inside of the lab. Um, however, once you get out into the environment, it's a different story. You know, there's a lot of different factors that will cause it not to, you know, come into contact with each other or, or work successfully. If it's mealybugs on foliage, that's a little bit harder um, because these nematodes are susceptible to desiccation and UV light. So usually it doesn't work that great with foliar pests. Um, earthworms, I haven't tried it myself, so I'm not going to say for sure, um, but I believe since they're not insects, um, that's not, they're not going to be harmed. These are very specific. So nematodes are very specific. Ones that go to plants, just go to plants. Ones that go to humans, just go to humans. You know, animals, certain ones, just like that. Insects. So they're very, very specific as far as, um, you know, what uh, type of organism that they can parasitize. Um, bees, um, I I don't think they were going to harm bees because of the many situations. They're not going to come into contact with like the bees itself. Also, bees have a social behavior where they won't let any other bees into the hive that have any nematodes on them. So these, this actually, this species has been used um, successfully on the mainland to um, kill um, the hive beetle. So you can apply it underneath your beehive. Um, to kill the um, beetle, lar the hive beetle larvae. So um, it's 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 all about the situation where the nematodes and the insects come together. You know, are they coming into contact in the proper environment for them to be a successful host? And then I think uh, Anthony. Oh. Whoever can provide the teeth, if you can give me Chinese rose beetle yeah, and larvae in large quantities, please call me <laughs> because I have been wanting to do this for years. It just seems like such a perfect fit for my nematodes. So um, please give me your contact information. Um, reach out to me. <laughs> and we've got another question from Jake in there on the application rates. Okay, application rate, this is so tricky because it's totally dependent on the tree because you can only fit so much liquid inside of those galleries. So if it's a very small tree with very little damage, you know, we've done as little as like two mils. Um, if it's like a large giant tree with tons of damage, we've done like 25 mils. Um, so this, it's, it ranges on to what you can do, how much you know liquid you can get in there. So, you know, we're talking anywhere from 6,000 nematodes to 200,000 nematodes. Um, so it's the size of the tree, the size of the galleries. Um, it's just what that's why the more places you can find to inject that needle, the more nematodes you can get in there, the more successful you're going to be. Uh, Roxana, do you see the potential for applying the nematodes via spraying? Yeah, so we started with spraying. Um, but then it just was like, it's just running down the tree. Like this is, this isn't, um, this isn't that effective. You know, like you really have to get it into the gallery because once the nematode, if it's outside, it's just gonna go down to the ground. It, that's its natural behavior is to wanna go back to the soil, I think. But once it's inside the tree, you know, it's it's, it's protected. It's like in this cryptic habitat and it's, you know, it's, it's food source is in there. But I think when you spray on the outside, we've even tried to spray with like a gel overlay to protect it. You're really exposing it to like UV light and desiccation. So just the survival of them isn't going to be that great. And then the ability for them to make it, you know, into the gallery themselves instead of just going down to the ground, you know, it's it's going to be um, very small. So you're, you're just going to get only a very small number of nematodes actually in there doing their job. You know, um, that's, that's why it's so much easier to spray because I tell you, this is a tedious technique, um, but it's what it takes to make it work. And then Jake, can follow up on how many, how many nematodes or what's the quantity uh, you get when you pick up from uh, this or from yourself and then I think a good addendum to that would be like about how many trees you could treat with that or um, if a large farm wanted to pick up a bunch would they be able to do that kind of thing okay that's a good question and I think that's something that we're going to have to work out so this is um we, we just uh, did the agreement with this right now they haven't you know um 
released their first batch yet, right? So that this is something that we're going to be learning as we go along, you know, how much is it feasible for them to make? How many people are coming to them to, to need these nematodes? You know, um, this is a, this is a lot, even making the nematodes is a tedious process. You have to rear insects in order to rear the nematodes. So you got two colonies going, um, you know, you're dependent on these two biological organisms to work at the right time. So um, this is all a process that we're gonna be working through. So usually when people come to me and they want nematodes, it just happens, what cycle are we in with our nematodes, right? So, you know, we just inoculated some for the next time. So I have these extras, we didn't use them, you know, here's, Whatever, whatever I got, a hundred thousand. Oh, here's a million. You know, it's just what I have. So this is not a commercial production operation yet. Right? We we gotta work this out. Um, and so that's the thing. How many trees you can do is like I said. How many? How much can you inject into one tree? You know. So that those are very tough questions that we don't have answers to right now. <laughs> and we will learn. That's why I want your feedback. I want you guys to, you know, hey, I picked up you know, half a million nematodes from BIS and I applied them to 10 trees or 20. I want to know that, you know, we need to understand that. So I, I need all you guys help to work with us so we can, um, you know, find the answers to these questions. Keith, did you have another question? Uh, Keith, do you want to ask another question? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah, so the bacteria that's the necessary killer, are you inoculate or how, how does that get uh, to the nematodes? So that's already existing in nature. So the nematodes come come with it and they, they can't survive without it because they're not able to parasitize insects without it. So they need it. And uh, the same with the bacteria, the bacteria cannot exist on its own because it can't parasitize insects without getting the carrier to move into it. So you need both of them and that's how they were built in nature. And one always comes with the other one. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you. And yes, I will um, get you uh, my contact info and we will start collecting adults right. and larvae because we do sift uh, larvae, I think. I think our larvae that we're finding are uh, Chinese rose beetle larvae because we have uh, Chinese rose beetles in mass numbers around here that just devastate stuff. They're our number one pest here. Oh, well, that's that's terrible. And um, I, I think this is a good system for these nematodes. I really do want to test it because um, I feel they would be effective. They're, they're not always, I mean, they work good in the lab, but they don't always work great when you go to the field. But there's certain systems that just work like sweet potato and um, QLB. And I think uh, Chinese rose beetle would also be one of them. I had a question um, for Debbie and Anthony um, specifically about the QLB, um, is it, were you noticing the trees that were being hit or infected um, were primarily pre predisposed or, um, you know, the ones that had pig damage and so they're, they're, they're already compromised or the ones that had moss and maybe the, the bark is already extremely soft and compromised. Are those the only trees that you're seeing get infested? with QLB, are these trees that are compromised already? Um, um, so I noticed the first time I noticed it in the Ulu was on a branch that I had pruned. And it was um, in that branch that had like a little stub remaining. Um, I, th I think it's from my experience, I think it's from the, the trees that are uh, injured or Maybe they're sending off like a pheromone that attracts the the QLB and then the pig damage, of course. Um, for me, a lot of the early damage I saw was in upper branches of taller trees. So they the pig damage uh, wasn't evident because they were above my head. Um, and I didn't know what the frass was. I just thought it was rather odd. And I'd see these piles of frass on the ground. So I don't think in my case that they were pig damaged many of them were not pig damaged, some of them are. Um, I don't think that the early trees that died were pig damaged, but um, it's all possible. Uh, the pigs like like to rub their tusks, tusks on, the, on the trees for sure. 
but I haven't had anything on either cacao or ulu yet. Um, but Trima, the uh, Trima orientalis, the, the gunpowder tree, that, that tree also gets it. And then, of course, the elderberry is just has thousands. <laughs> and we, we had another field visit to Anthony's maybe about a year ago with a different um, USDA entomologist who mentioned that there may be some type of um, relationship of progression between like ambrosia beetles in the trunks um, and them coming in first and, and the QLB moving in after. Is there any correlation to that or? Um, usually like the ambrosia beetle. Uh, that would be more for Roxanne, I think. Oh, sorry, sorry, go ahead. No, let Stacy hit that one because I was just gonna say I've, I've, I've seen it, but I don't know. <laughs> Um, ambrosia beetles will naturally hit or infest dead and dying stress trees. So whichever comes first, if the tree is dying because of QLB, they're going to, they're going to come to it because that's what they go, they go for. Um, but I'm not sure if, yeah, the, the, um, ambrosia beetles are come for any dying and stress tree anyway whether it's from QLB or just a disease or any natural cause. But I'm not sure if there's a... Yeah, if, if the QLB is killing the tree, the ambrosia beetle will come after. And regardless whether or not, you know, it's, it just wants a dying tree, the ambrosia beetles. All right. Okay, and we got Jake with another one. Unmute myself on this one. Sorry if you hear my baby in the background. Um, but I, I just to go off of that too, I, I noticed it on our uh, cuckoo nut trees we have. We don't really ever prune or anything, uh, do anything to them, but I noticed more damage and more of the trees getting attacked uh, since we had uh, more drought stress between last year and this year. We're almost down to none of our cuckoo nut trees right now because they've been getting just hit so hard because that's one tree that requires more. Uh, water just consistently so i noticed they were stressed a lot more and same with their cacao just wanted to throw that out there if it helps anybody I definitely noticed them more on the stress trees thanks jake um and then ryan had another question roxana in there about rearing the bacteria Oh, yeah. Okay. Ryan wants to know if the bacteria can be reared as an inoculum without the nematode for injection. And um, the bacteria uh, can be reared um, on its own. There's a problem, though, with uh, losing, uh, there's like a phase uh, switch. So it actually can lose um, its pathogenicity quickly when you rear it in a solution on its own. Um, however, I have a colleague who um, is working on that right now, and I think they have made some progress. Um, however, I feel like, especially in this situation, that um, the nematode is the one that's hunting down the larvae. So it's actually the, the carrier of the bacteria. So we need the nematode to, you know, chase down these larvae because it'll otherwise it'll be like just like the Bavaria treatments where, yeah, Bavaria will kill the QLB larvae, but it can't go down into those galleries and find it on its own. So um, I feel like we, we do need the the nematode in this particular case. Uh, Anthony, do you want to ask Anthony? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so if I were to inoculate some of my trees, what's the likelihood of the nematode population establishing in my soil? Um, I'm particularly interested because, you know, what do I do with all my branches and trees and logs that are infested with these nematodes? Like, I'm wondering if they're in the soil, I can pile the, the decaying matter in a certain area and maybe the nematodes will naturally work their way up into that pile of de decomposing logs. Um, unfortunately, they probably won't work their way up. I, I mean, I have done some work with um, with coffee um, uh, berry borer, 
where we tried to uh, apply the nematodes to the coffee cherries on the ground and thinking we could get rid of those um, inoculum source, you know, um, they're, you know, they're all in those fallen cherries, but we didn't have good result. Even though it looked good in the lab, they did very well. When we went out to the field, the nematodes just went down. So usually um, they don't want to uh, come up because they're happy, happiest in the soil. Um, if some spill out and go and like fall into the soil, uh, they probably um, will survive if there's like a food source though. Um, I don't know. I think I would like to hear from Stacy about what he recommends people do with their prune um, branches though. Um, I think at one time we discussed it with um, Shana Sims and Tracy Matsumoto. I think, and you, I think, I'm not sure, like, the, the chipping of everything would be down to a quarter inch and spread it out, I think, um, um, to prevent um, the larva from continu continually feeding. Uh, I guess you, you shred it and spread it out, it dries up, and you probably kill some of the larva and people too through the machinery. Um, if I think that's what we um, kind of suggested I think before can I ask a question um I didn't know how to raise my hand sorry um so we just were talking, sorry we were just talking to our colleagues in Guam about coconut rhinoceros beetle and how to um, you know, protect our mulch or actually make traps for coconut rhinoceros beetle using, um, you know, you've got your green waste and you put a net over it and then the coconut rhinoceros beetle cannot leave the net. They get caught in it and then they die. So I guess a lot of people don't have the ability to chop their mulch in their, you know, their their branches and trimmings. Is it possible that some kind of netting over your green waste pile or mulch pile could work for Queensland longhorn beetle also? Um, I guess probably be yeah. I mean, you can also, if that works, you can wrap your trees with the netting and catch all the beetles you want. I don't know, like get creative and try something different. It might work. Roxana. Yeah, I agree. I mean, at this point, we we need to um, get really innovative and try as many different techniques as we can. Um, we're going to be looking at some uh, different um, maybe things that we can do to avoid the um, you know having the adult ova position in the first place. You know, these are the kind of trials we're going to be working on um, in the new year and spring. So if anybody has adults, they can bring them to us. We're trying to collect them and um, develop a colony. So we have enough insects. Like I was saying, we need enough insects to do these trials so we can test different treatments. But that's something, you know, we want to look at in the future. So um, nettings, um, anything that can um, you know, discourage them from, from, from landing and, and laying their eggs. I mean, these are all things that we need to try and we all have to just work together and test all of these ideas because you never know what's going to really be effective and might just help the industry so much. Roxanne, are you able to ship these nematodes into Ireland? Well, um, I, I'm not sure about that. Um, I have found them on all the islands, though, so um, maybe we can find partners um, on the other islands that can, um, you know, we can we can recover them for them. So we we have um, they are available on all the islands naturally occurring. So if we could find uh, partners on each island would be would be the best way probably to approach that. Okay, I will check awesome. with our um, state of Hawaii Department of Agriculture plant quarantine branch, and I'll get back to Roxana um, on that answer. Thanks, Stacey. Yeah, that would be great. Thank you. And I think we got one more question. We'll probably wrap it up after this because we are a little bit past uh, the intended time, and I just want to respect everybody's 
dinner commitments and uh, family commitments. So we'll finish up with Jake asking, are there any traps available to catch the QLB currently? Um, Stacy's still on him. Let's get a give him that, <laughs> give him that one because I'm, I'm not um, really I, sure what's going on with the chat. Well, I think like like Debbie was saying. I mean, they tried some of these traps, but the pheromone attractant was variable. It wasn't really uh, catching the majority. Is like like hit and miss kind of catches. Like Debbie, I think only caught like ten or something. Debbie, can you um I can jump in a little bit here, okay. Stacey. Um okay. thank you. Uh, there there was yeah, there was someone who was studying that at P Bark. You guys are so awesome. And um the the it kind of fell off, but uh they did finally hit upon a pheromone that they thought might work. Um, but unfortunately, the funding had dropped right at the point where they found it. So the Forest Service is now proposing to take that on, and they have written a grant um, to hopefully start doing research trials. We don't know if they've received that money yet. That will that would be um, Kyle Roy, who's done a lot of work on rapid ohia death. So um, we should find out in the next couple of months if they're going to be able to start those trials, and then we, we would be um, trying to help them reach out to folks to be able to... Um, do some of that work on their properties, but um, there is some pursuit of that. Currently, there isn't anything available, um, but there there are folks trying to go in that direction with the pheromone traps. Awesome. Um, yeah, and I, I didn't mean to cut off if anybody has extra questions, please feel free um, to forward them to Roxana, or um, if you guys want to get more info from Anthony or Debbie, uh, you guys can email me um, or the co-op, and we can definitely provide you with that info. We'll be hosting this um, <clears throat> webinar. Um, I'm going to stop the recording right now. Let's see.